allowed to withdraw. All right, you ready to roll? Yep. Okay. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. You can take your seats. Okay, guys. Uh, I'm Stephen Ballou. I'm the president of the Brooklyn Law School chapter of the Federalist Society. For those of you who don't know, the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. The society, society seeks to promote an awareness of these principles and to further their application through its activities. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Josh Blackman. Mm -hmm. Professor Blackman is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law, who specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Professor Blackman is the author of the book, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare the constitutional challenge to Obamacare. Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes magazine for the 30 under 30 in law and policy. He has testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of, executive, of President Obama's executive action on immigration. That's this. <laughs> yep. He is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Professor Blackman is the founder and president of the Harlan Institute and the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league and he blogs at joshblackman.com. He leads the cutting edge of legal analysis as director of judicial research at Lex Predict, and is the author of over two dozen law review articles. That's enough, that's enough of a bio, that's good enough. Right. Anything else? Uh, Any oh. Also, uh, after Professor Blackman's uh, presentation, Professor, our very own Professor Nelson Tebby will be providing commentary. Uh, Professor Tebby, is teaches courses on constitutional law, religious freedom, and legal theory and professional responsibility. Uh, he's a past chair of the law and religion section of the Association of American Law Schools and is co-organizer co of the annual law and religion roundtable. Uh, he joined Brooklyn Law School from St. John's University of Law where he received a Dean's Teaching Award. Before teaching, he clerked for Judge John M. Walker Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and practice law at the ACLU and at Davis Polk and Wardwell. Uh, he's a Fulbright Scholar at the unit, he was also a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Cape Town. So without further, further ado, Professor Blackman. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be back. I was here in Brooklyn last year talking about 3D printed guns. And today I'm talking about immigration. I am a, I'm a native of Staten Island, so this is about the closest I can get to home. In fact, I'll be on the ferry in about two hours from now. So the topic today is actually very timely. We are discussing the president's executive action in immigration. Now, I did not plan that the evening before I came to talk to you, the Fifth Circuit would release a 135-page opinion, which I'm about a third of the way through, on this case. I didn't plan this, nor was I teaching last night until 8 o'clock p.m. at a 6 a.m. flight. So I, instead of sleeping on the plane, I was reading this opinion. I'll give you all the background. So what is going on here? Um, during the past seven years, there have been several efforts to reform immigration law legislatively. And I need to actually have a disclosure at the front. The very policies that I assail are unconstitutional, I think are good policy. I'm, I'm in one of these weird, odd academic places where I support the policy, but I think they're unlawful, for whatever that's worth. So the first of these policies was called the DREAM Act, and this, I think, was a good piece of legislation. The DREAM Act would have said, if you were a minor who came to the United States illegally without permission, and it wasn't your fault, and you've gone on to become a you know, law-abiding citizen, you graduated from school, we will give you a pathway to citizenship. Okay, I think this was a good bill, but it failed in the Congress. Congress stopped it. Okay, so what happened after the DREAM Act was killed in Congress? In June of 2012, the uh, Secretary Napolitano announced a policy that became known as DACA, D-A-C-A. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And keep these acronyms straight, it gets alphabet soup in a bit. So DACA was a program announced by the federal government, uh, by, me, by the executive branch. And it said like this, if you came here illegally as a child and you went on to be a good person, no criminal history, you graduated from school, you know, you're an upstanding citizen, we will grant you deferred action. What is deferred action? 
It's a type of lawful presence. It's not citizenship, and it is not amnesty. Let me make that point clear. This is not about amnesty. What it does do is the government says, we will not remove you. We will not deport you. But as a consequence of granting the status, or sorry, of lawful presence, a person is now eligible to work. And if you're able to work, you work, you pay taxes, you do everything else uh, a citizen could do short of perhaps voting other things. You're eligible for the earned income tax credit, you get social security, there are lots of things that you can do. Okay, this was not the end of the immigration debate. A couple of years later, a bill was passed actually in the Senate called Bipartisan Immigration Reform. And this would have provided a pathway to citizenship for nearly 11 million aliens in the United States unlawfully. 11 million. Remarkably, this passed the Senate. But like all good things, the House went to die. Uh, indeed, the uh, uh, Speaker of the House, John Boehner, um, never even brought this up for a vote. An uh, interesting background on that, does everyone remember the name Eric Cantor? Eric Cantor was a Republican from Virginia, the House Majority Leader, very high ranking. He was challenged in a primary by a guy who opposed his policy immigration. Remarkably, some no-name guy, actually a professor of economics, I think, defeated Eric Cantor, the number two Republican in the House. That special election came three days before the House was to vote on this big immigration bill. Boehner said, I can't do this. My members will get creamed if they vote for it. So it never came up for a vote. Okay. I support the bill. And it's failed. But what happened next has become a very common pattern in the age of the President Obama's administration. Congress said no. Okay, so a few hours later, the President had a press conference at the Rose Garden, flanked by Vice President Biden. And President Obama basically said, if Congress won't act, I will. I will do everything in my power to uh, 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 improve our broken immigration system. So he didn't act right away. No, he in fact waited until two weeks after the election, the last election that would actually matter during his administration, November 2014. And President Obama announced, excuse me, a policy known as DAPA, D-A-P-A. -A. Now there's DACA with a C and DAPA with a P. What does DAPA stand for? It depends who you ask. Uh, but the easiest one is Deferred Action for Parents of Americans. They've had many different acronyms, but that's my favorite one. Deferred Action for Parents of Americans. What does this mean? If you are a citizen, I'm sorry, if you're an alien who's here unlawfully and you have a U.S. citizen child, right? Your child is a U.S. citizen. You can then gain deferred action status as a result of your kinship. Same way if you have a child who's a lawfully permanent resident, LPR you can then gain this deferred action status as a consequence of your child being here, as long as you don't have a criminal history and then some other factors uh, I don't really have time to get into. So then a funny thing happened, right? When DACA was first announced, you know, people may have grumbled, but there was no big movement to try to stop it. There were some errant lawsuits here and there, but, but nothing of any salience. But with DAPA, this occasioned a much bigger reaction. Perhaps a simple reason that people actually empathize with the children who are brought here without their permission and, you know, through no fault of their own, they're in the United States. But DAPA didn't have that same sort of humanitarian valence. Indeed, there's people who willfully came here knowing they were not uh, lawfully allowed to enter or remain in the country, as it may be. So within about a week of the DAPA policy being announced, the state of Texas, where, where, where I live, um, filed a lawsuit challenging the legality of DAPA on several grounds. So the first ground is based on what's called the Administrative Procedures Act. Basically, they said this was a substantive policy that needs to go through notice and comment rulemaking. I'm not going to bore you with that. That's a boring, okay? The second claim, and the much more potentially dangerous claim, is based on the Constitution. Article 2 of the Constitution provides the president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And this is a clause you probably never studied. In fact, in your constitutional law textbook, there may be a paragraph on the take clear clause, if that. My students get an entire class on it, but, those, but that's not normal. And Texas charged that the president was effectively abdicating his responsibilities under the law. He was not faithfully, in good faith, if I may, executing the law. So then something else crazy happened. A federal district judge in Brownsville, Texas, Judge Hainan, issued a nationwide injunction putting DAPA on ICE. Okay. No one 
except maybe me and a couple other people who followed this, expected that to happen, right? People didn't anticipate that this thing could be stopped, but he did. The Obama administration appealed to the Fifth Circuit, and they said, please put Judge, Judge Haining's ruling on hold so we can, you know, start implementing this policy. And the Fifth Circuit denied the stay. They said, you know what? You're likely to lose the merits. And then the case was argued on the merits. And they asked the Fifth Circuit, please let us go ahead and implement this policy. And just yesterday at 7 p.m. Central Time, as I was teaching at Burgerfall and Con Law, the, <laughs> the Fifth Circuit dropped a 135-page opinion, finding that under the Administrative Procedures Act, that this policy needs to go through notice and comment rulemaking, and as it was implemented, was void. Okay, what comes next? Just as I was eating a burger in Shake Shack, or the headline, the president will appeal to the Supreme Court. This is this is ongoing. We, we're in real time now, folks. So the president will appeal to the Supreme Court. The Fifth Circuit ruling was perfectly timed. That if the Solicitor General files an appeal this week, a cert petition this week, and Texas does not get an extension, which may happen, I don't know. Then the case will be distributed for conference on January 8th, recirculated on January 15th, and granted for an argument the last week in April of 2015. Yes, I've worked out the math, right? So if the SG files this week, the case we heard this year, and decided three months before the next presidential election, um, if Texas is able to get some sort of extension and it's been kicked beyond this January period, um, depending if the justices want to move quickly or not, this case won't be heard until next year after the presidential election. Um, that's a very big determination because depending who wins the next election, this policy may disappear, may poof, vanish. So what I want to talk about in my time here is a constitutional claim. So the first point is, much to my chagrin, the Fifth Circuit did not reach the constitutional issue. They resolved it properly on the narrow administrative law grounds as a court ought to do. That doesn't stop us from talking about it, right? Uh, we, we like the more you know, juicy issues underneath. So why do I think that DAPA is not, I'm sorry, is inconsistent with the president's duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed? And to answer this question, I actually have to look at a document produced by the Obama Justice Department, the, the Office of Legal Counsel. This is like the, the constitutional lawyers for the, uh, uh, you know, the, the president, right? When the president has a, a constitutional question, he solicits an opinion from this Office of Legal Counsel. And they issued an opinion on the day DAPA was announced that I think actually does a pretty good job at sketching out a framework. So here's what the court says. The executive, the president, you know what, can't under the guise of exercising enforcement discretion attempt to rewrite the laws to match his preferences. What does this mean? The president can always say, you know what, I'm exercising discretion. I'm going to prioritize these cases over these cases. That's fine. No one disagrees with that. But the Office of Legal Counsel recognized a limit. The president can't do this when, in fact, he's just trying to rewrite the laws or indeed ignore the laws he doesn't like, that there's this limit. So how do you know when, when you hit this line between good and bad? This is, this is our question. So the, the office writes that the executive's enforcement decisions must be, quote, consonant with rather than contrary to congressional policy, right? The enforcement discretion must be consistent with congressional policies. This is Justice Jackson's framework in Youngstown, which I'm sure you all recall, that the president and Congress must be acting on the same level. When they're acting the same level, the president's powers are at their height. When the, when the president's doing something that Congress rejected, the president acts at his lowest ebb, and you have this weird nether zone of twilight in the middle. So in order to resolve this question, we have to ask ourselves, are the president's actions with DAPA consistent with or consonant with congressional policy? And the answer to that question is, is no, and I'll explain for two main reasons. Um, the first reason is that Congress has uh, 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 expressed through an intricate code various types of groups that are somewhat favored or disfavored for sorts of relief. So for example, if a parent comes to this country and the parent is not uh, a, a US citizen, and the parent gives birth. So by virtue of the 14th Amendment, the child at birth is a naturalized US citizen. Now contrary to what Donald Trump may say, it's simply not feasible for that child to immediately petition 
for a green card for the parent. That's not how this works. And indeed, the, 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 the Trump, the, the pregnancy tourism, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, doesn't work for one very important reason. A citizen child must wait to the age of 21 to petition for a green card for his or her parent. This 21-year gap was not an accident. Indeed, if you look at the, uh, the debates in 1965, the 50th anniversary to this year, of the Immigration Nationality Act, you have Senator Ted Kennedy, I'm sorry, Senator Robert Kennedy, and Senator Irvin, these are not flaming liberal, a flaming conservative, saying, you know what? We don't want people coming here, having kids, and getting citizenship right away. It was a deliberate effort to delay the time between a citizen being born and when that citizen can petition for relief from their parents. Indeed, what's to happen is the child must turn 21, then the parent must leave the country, undergo counselor processing abroad, basically go to a U.S. embassy in their country of origin, and then re-enter, right? The very policy that Congress designed countenance a two-decade gap where the person could be removed and a break in family ties to leave the country and re-enter at whatever the cost or hardship that may be. Now, you may think that's an unfair policy. You may think that's cruel. Fine, I'm with you. I think it's probably way too much, but that's the policy we have. DAPA operates to circumvent that in every respect. Rather than making the person wait 21 years, perhaps in fear of being removed, and there's a deterrence there, that goes away while the person is given this deferred action status. More importantly, there's no need for the person to leave the country to re-enter at any point because the deferred action status keeps them here. And the president's been very clear. His sincere hope is that this deferred action status is temporary and it's revocable, but lasts so long as necessary until immigration laws are changed, right? That is almost a black letter example of the president trying to disregard the laws because he doesn't agree with them, right? He's trying to achieve a goal the laws doesn't provide by simply using prosecutorial discretion as what may be called a pretext. The second rationale has to do with past practice. So very often executive powers, and Justice Jackson recognizes this implicitly, we don't have very good text in the Constitution to decide executive power decisions. We just, we don't have it, right? These are not bright line rules. So the Supreme Court has recognized in many respects that prior practice is very relevant. If the president has been doing something for a very long time and Congress has never objected, that doesn't mean the president has the power, but it should give the courts pause or hesitation before they invalidate an act of the president. So, for example, we consider the recent appointment case from a couple of years ago, right? The president has been making recent appointments during the session of Congress for, for, for decades, and Congress has never seemed to mind. And the court said, that's an indication that the president can probably do this. So what do we have here? Has Congress acquiesced, or has Congress agreed with the scope of executive power, the scope of this sort of deferred action? And the short answer is no, they haven't. Okay? There have been instances of deferred action in the past, they fall into usually one of two categories. So the first involves the president's powers of a foreign policy. For example, say that you have refugees from Tiananmen Square, right? This was, a, this was a human rights disaster. And the president granted those people deferred action status, right? That was based on a very specific grant to a specific nationality as part of the United States foreign policy interest. I think it was probably a good idea. Or the Haitian, uh, well, the Haitian boat people, or, or these various other humanitarian crises, right? These instances of deferred action are very specific to nations in our foreign interest. The other types of deferred action, though, have been what I have called a bridge status. And although the Fifth Circuit didn't cite my opinion, they did cite this bridge analogy, which I will take credit for. So it works like this. So imagine you are a student at Tulane University in New Orleans in 2005. You've registered for your classes, and then the third week of the semester, Hurricane Katrina slams into the Gulf. Your university is now shut down. If you were a foreign student, You've just lost your visa. To be a foreign student, you're required to have a certain credit load. If you fall below that credit load, you, you lose your visa. And by the way, you are now subject to immediate removal. And if you stay and persist in the country when you don't have your visa, you can actually be denied re-entry at a later juncture, right? So what did President George W. Bush do? He said, I will use deferred action. If you are a student in the Gulf Coast and you enroll at another university in January, the next following semester, I will not deport you. I will give you deferred action for three or four months as a temporary bridge from when you had a student visa to when you have a student visa the next time. And what you see is almost every instance where the president has used a sort of deferred action, it's been as this bridge where there was some sort of status on the other end, you know, the, the proverbial pot of gold on the other end of the rainbow. Okay? 
With DAPA beneficiaries, there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Even if a, a parent waits the 21 years and gets deferred acts renewed, 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 they first have to leave the country and re-enter. There are so many contingencies there that there's not some sort of a transitional status, but a status unto itself. Okay. Other examples involving uh, 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 people protecting the Violence Against Women Act, uh, uh, victims of torture protection. These are instances where there's a temporary status or the status was ancillary to some other bigger congressional change. What we have here is simply a weight, a weight that hopefully Congress will pass a new law, and if they pass a new law, well, then maybe they'll get some status. But under the current regime that Congress has, that's not the case. So for these two reasons, right? First, that the group of people DAPA benefits is not consistent with those Congress's right to benefit. And second, this deferred action is not being used as a bridge from one status or another. For these two reasons, DAPA is not consistent. It's not consonant with, with the congressional policy. And because it's not consonant with congressional policy in terms of Youngstown, we are at the lowest ebb, where the president's powers must be scrutinized very closely. And though I freely admit that the court hasn't had the occasion to refine that something's invalid under the Take Care Clause, the size and scope of this action, in light of the fact that we scrutinize it closely, is a good case of why this action must be stopped and not be allowed to go on. Thank you very much. I'll let my good friend Nelson uh, offer some comments, and I'll be back up here later for other questions. So thank you so much. Well, that's terrific. I, I just want to thank Professor Blackman for coming all this way to speak to you guys. Um, he's a national expert on these issues and uh, his work is widely cited. And uh, you know, if, if you were sitting in my shoes, you would know um, just how prominent he is and how impressive that is given his young age. And, but it's really a terrific, it's terrific to, to have him here. It's, it, we're really lucky. We should thank the Federal Society for uh, making this kind of thing possible. Um, it's through the, and, you know, I mean the student chapter, but also the national organization. It's through their um, generosity that events like this can happen. And hey, they, you were from Newark. It's very generous. <laughs> <laughs> and they enrich our community. So it's a, it's a really nice thing. Um, you know, Professor Blackman knows much more about um, this issue than I do. Um, but I have taught um, the uh, Judge Hayden's case before, and I'm sort of familiar with the issues in a general way. So I thought what I would do is just use my time to kind of ask some questions of Professor Blackman. And then, um, no, well, it'll take me a couple minutes, so you can, get, you can be comfortable. Um, and then, um, and then I thought we could, uh, you know, you guys might have additional questions. I hope you do. We can start get a conversation going. Um, you know, I think everything that he said is accurate, but there are kind of different ways to think about what about the difference between prosecutorial discretion and a change in law, right? So the basic uh, idea is the one he articulated, namely. Um, it's the, it is the prerogative of the executive branch to decide which cases to prosecute, right? So you know this from law and order and so forth. Not everyone who commits a crime is going to get prosecuted. The executive branch can make a decision about which crimes to prosecute, which crimes not to prosecute. Um, and that decision is unreviewable by courts, right? So the, the courts can't even um, uh, second guess or in any way review uh, the executive's decision not to prosecute. It's also very familiar that um, the executive branch will make these decisions not just um, at, at the prosecutor level, but that the um, Department of Justice will issue guidance on how prosecutors should exercise their, um, their prosecutorial discretion. That's very familiar, right? Um, but as Professor Blackman said, it's also the case that this practice has become controversial during the Obama administration because the Obama administration has used this power to kind of deal with gridlock in Congress, right? So the fact that Congress is not working is not something that's unfamiliar to all of you or to any American who's paying any attention to what's going on in Washington. Congress has the lowest approval ratings, not only of at any governmental entity, um, but in history. Right, I mean, it is, I think, fewer than, t uh, or less than 10% of the American population thinks that Congress is doing a good job. It's really bad, and they have, you know, and this is a bipartisan idea, um, and there's good reason to be kind of dissatisfied with Congress, because in fact, things are not getting done that ought to get done, right? So the Obama administration has um, used creative mechanisms to try to do whatever it can to deal with um, gridlock in Congress, and these in immigration orders are the best example. But they do present a legitimate legal question 
um, not the one that the um, uh, district judge in Texas or the Fifth Circuit addressed, namely the Administrative Procedure Act question, but a constitutional question, which I pose to my uh, students as well. So like, what is the difference between um, you know, uh, prosecutorial discretion on the one hand that's based on kind of a policy concern um, and legislating from the executive branch, which is not okay under our constitution, right? Only Congress can legislate. Um, and it is the case that, and you know, the Office of Legal Counsel said this, and Professor Blackman said it too, that one determination, one way you tell the difference between prosecutorial discretion and rewriting law in an impermissible way is whether the discretion is um, executed in a way that's con consonant with congressional policy. Um, and I think Professor Blackman's arguments on that score are good ones. I think there are other arguments probably to be had as well. But I want to just add a couple more factors that courts look to when they think about whether an exercise of prose prosecutorial discretion is constitutional. In addition to whether it's consonant with congressional policy, courts also ask, um, does this effectuate a legal change, right? Is, the, is this a legal change in status for the affected person? Prosecutorial discretion does not um, change someone's legal status. It's just a decision not to prosecute. And the second question is, or another question is, is the determination individualized or categorical, right? So when Congress acts, it acts in a categorical way, right? The, the Bill of Attainer um, provision in the Constitution is one bulwark against congressional activity that's specified to an individual. But prosecutorial discretion is individualized by nature, right? So it's, uh, so what happens is prosecutors will ask, like, is this, guy, this person, you know, um, worthy of prosecution or should we use our resources um, to prosecute someone else, given that we can't prosecute everybody, right? Um, and if you think about those two criteria, I mean, I guess this is a question for Professor Blackman, but don't they point in the opposite direction because this, uh, neither DACA, which I, you didn't address directly, but maybe you have elsewhere, or DAPA, um, effectuate a change in the legal status of these people, right? They are not citizens. They are not eligible for citizenship. It does not create a path to citizenship, right? There are no changes in legal rights um, for, for these, uh, or at least in their immigration status for these people. It is true they're allowed to work, but that's a familiar consequence of deferred um, action in these in these areas. And I don't think in that alone um, makes this a change in legal status. So that's a question. And also, the action is specifically, according to the orders that were handed down um, by Secretary Johnson, um, individualized, meaning like the secretary has told line prosecutors or other federal officials who are dealing with individuals, you have to, you have to assess this on a case-by-case -case basis, right? You can't, you can't make a categorical kind of um, judgment. So um, I think those considerations point in the opposite direction, but I may be wrong. Um, another question is uh, for Professor Blackman, like if you're right about this, doesn't that mean that notice and comment would not cure the problem, right? Um, and it, it, if that's true, then um, it seems like it, this, theory is a little bit at odds with what the Fifth Circuit was saying, because if the Fifth Circuit um, it, 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 you know, is saying you have to go through notice and comment, but even that would be unconstitutional, then it seems like the Fifth Circuit is kind of barking up the wrong tree and maybe is wrongheaded in the way it's going about this. Um, so that's a sort of a simpler question. On the bridge issue, like that's a very interesting uh, argument. Again, just to reprise what Professor Blackman said, um, he said, you know, in past instances where presidents have offered deferred, um, uh, deferred action for immigrants, um, it's been when there's a contemplated permanent status that's going to be available for these people down the road. Well, gosh, you know, are we in that situation? I mean, there's bipartisan agreement that, con that Congress should act on immigration, that the immigration system is not working. Um, and if there's anything that the parties agree on, it's something like the DREAM Act or DACA, right? Um, so I think we can anticipate with some confidence uh, that this problem will be solved. You know, shifts in electoral politics, so I guess we're not supposed to take into account, but further point in this direction because, you know, um, the um, proportion of the American population that is comprised of recent immigrants or um, uh, people sympathetic to them is, you know, increasing over time. So I think for political reasons too, we can see like there will be a change in law. And wouldn't it be, um, you know, not compassionate 
um, for the president not to take that into account and give some relief um, to these children and parents of children um, who are here, you know, and, and are subject to the vagaries of a Congress that is not working but will address this issue at some point. Um, so those, I guess, are my three sort of questions and things I'm curious about. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, I appreciate Professor Tebby's questions, which are which astute, and also, by the way, you have, you have an esteemed faculty. You may not realize it. And uh, law students don't think about this. We have a, you have an extremely highly ranked and well-regarded faculty, and I'm very privileged that uh, uh, your, your, your colleague and professor is able to comment on my talk. So let's talk first about it, prosecutorial discretion, right? Um, it goes without saying that the president can't deport everyone. It's frankly impossible. Congress doesn't appropriate enough money to engage in that act. He only appropriates enough money for roughly 400,000 removals a year, and the President Obama has been uh, uh, dutifully engaging in that number. So how can it be that you're saying, Josh, how can it be that if he's still removing 400,000 people, he's not actually engaging in this sort of uh, 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 action? So the points Professor Tebby raised is about the individualized case-by-case -case assessment, right? Is DAPA a categorical grant of deferred action, or is it done on a case-by-case -case basis? So one of the arguments advanced in this case is that, in fact, line officers do not have any sort of discretion. All of the discretion is designed by the secretary. And in fact, in earlier drafts of this policy, there was effectively a series of checkboxes. And if you check this box and check this box and check this box, well, then the person was given status. And these boxes are not, you know, subjective. It's, does the person have a felony? No. Does a person have any sort of, a, 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 you know, criminal history? No. Okay, go down to bottom box, deferred action. And in a remarkable showing, Judge Hainan, the district judge, asked the government many times, can you identify one instance where a person was denied DACA for purely discretionary reasons? Based on a hardship or something, or maybe the person was a bad person, they could identify one, not a single case. They, they brought three or four forward. In each case, the person had either some sort of minor felony conviction or had some sort of perjury or had some sort of you know, fraudulent signature or something. Every single case they brought forward, they didn't have any evidence of discretion. In fact, until recently, the government had no way of tracking the reasons for denial. The grant rate was nearly 99%, and the ones that were denied, most people didn't fill the paperwork out correctly. right? So even though there's a pretext of a case-by-case -case determination, it was, in every, every respect, categorical. Um, is it 100% categorical? No, there were some denials. But in terms of scrutinizing this closely, is this close enough to some sort of blanket abdication? Uh, I think it is. Now, I'm doing them out of order, but the other point Professor Tebby raised is a good one, right? If I'm right, and I think I am, but you know, <laughs> You know, if I'm right and this is unconstitutional, what's the big deal about this notice and comment stuff, right? If you read the opinion today, which I'm halfway through, and <laughs> which I, the parts I've read at least, if you read the opinion from today, it makes it pretty clear, and it, again, by citing my bridge example, that this is not consistent congressional policy. Even if the president goes back and does notice and comment, that won't save it. I think this is why President Obama hasn't just gone and done notice and comment, right? He could have just dismissed his entire suit, put it through notice and comment, and he probably almost be done by now. But he didn't do that because the constitutional issue is still lingering. So this issue will remain. And uh, oh, what was the last question you asked? Uh, well, about the bridge. About the, oh, about the, about the bridge idea, right? So, so this is actually, this is actually a, 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 a point that I think resonates well. Congress is extremely unpopular. Um, they, don't, they don't do things very well anymore. They don't do things at all. Um, and indeed, there's crippling gridlock in Washington. Okay. Now, this this is gonna be a little this is gonna be probably unpopular when I say this, but gridlock is a feature, not a bug, of our constitutional order. Indeed, that's what Justice Scalia wrote in the Nolkan decision. I think the fact that Washington's so polarized is a reflection that people are so polarized. Perhaps living in Brooklyn and not in Texas, you don't see this very often, but immigration is a pretty divisive issue where I hail from now. Again, I'm from Staten Island, but I haven't lived here in a number of years. Um, indeed, the disagreement between parties, right? We do not have a single moderate Democrat in the Senate anymore. We don't have a single Republican who's a moderate in the Senate. We don't have, you know, uh, uh, you know the blue dog Democrats. They're not existing anymore. We don't have the moderate Republicans. Um, this reflection that the populace has fractured. Um, I always use this anecdote to explain it. Um, the general survey tracks a lot of 
questions. One of the questions they ask is, are you okay with your child dating some of the opposite race? Okay. And in a tribute to our society, that number has been going down. So no, yeah, no problem, right? So society is becoming more tolerant of the children dating some of the opposite race. Beautiful, right? Another question, are you okay with your child dating some of the opposite political party? That's going up. So people today are more upset with their child dating a Democrat, if they're Republican, or vice versa, than their kid dating some of the opposite race. So in some respects, we have a side that's becoming more tolerant in every respect, but also we have a side that's becoming more polarized in palpable uh, um, demarcations, right? So, you know, does it trouble me that Congress can't pass bills? Sure. But is this a function of how our society is structured? Well, yeah, and maybe demographic changes will change that, and that, that very well may be true. But is it fair to say that because Congress in you know, the next five, ten, however many years will pass something, that that is an expectation that the President Obama can rely on a humanitarian basis? I think the answer is no. And, and the reason why I say that is because there's no guarantee a thing will pass, right? I mean, if you'd asked in 2009 what kind of laws President Obama would pass, we'd have a list this long, and like three of them passed when he had 60 votes in the Senate. And that's better. And the Affordable Care Act may not be around for long. Another talk will come back to you for that. So I don't think the president can count in his future legislation when he's trying to bridge the status. And this bridge example, again, this is not set in stone, right? But this is a way of understanding past practice and acquiescence. While Congress has acquiesced and given into all the previous instances of deferred action, Congress has not acquiesced to this one. In fact, they violently opposed it. They tried to defund it. You may recall the federal government almost shut down last year to try to defund DAPA. But surprise, surprise, folks, you can't stop DAPA. DAPA is funded by user fees. In other words, people pay the fee to apply. That's what funds it. Even if Congress shut down the Department of Homeland Security, not a dollar for their budget, DAPA would persist. And I should note, the DAPA memo, the, the, the Office of Legal Counsel memo, gleefully know this fact that, by the way, you guys can't stop us. Suckers, right? This can't be defunded. And I think in part, this is why this program um, frustrated me so much, because Congress can't even use the power of the purse to stop this. Even if they had wanted to fund it, they couldn't, which is another reason why I think scrutiny is particularly salient. Did I get all of your questions? I think I got them. I think. So let me, let me, let me uh, add one more thought. So um, uh, just roughly one year ago when this was announced, I was on the PBS NewsHour with Gwen Eiffel. And yeah, you know, we're having this discussion back and forth. You're seeing this booth. You can't see anything. It's a little bug in your ear. And then, you know, I just say something like, you know, Gwen, how would you like it if President Ted Cruz decided to use his prosecutorial discretion not to enforce environmental laws? Or if President Rand Paul used prosecutorial discretion not to enforce aspects of the corporate income tax? And she was like, oh. Right, she, she was going after me, right? But she was like, oh. And I think that, that, that registers. Um, let me put it this way. People who are progressive have much more to fear from prosecutorial discretion than conservatives, right? Progressives want laws to be enforced, usually. Conservatives don't. And in fact, uh, one of the aspects of the Bush administration immigration, which I don't know if it was lawful, I would say too closely, <laughs> was that they decided they, they weren't going to go after certain sort of types of offenders. They weren't going to go after people who employ illegals, right? Well, the same tool set, each president builds from one to the next to the next, right? You think President Obama's going to ratchet back executive power? No, it's Bush's third term. You think the next one, Clinton or Cruz, whoever it is, will be much different? Of course not. Sanctioning this sort of precedent will give a serious foothold for the president to simply say, you know what, the Clean Air Act, I just, I don't have enough money to enforce all that. I'm just gonna go after the big offenders. I'm not gonna worry about it, right? Oh, and this is the other question I didn't answer, right? But what makes DAPA, I think, different than perhaps President Cruz not prosecuting Clean Air Act offenders is twofold. First, it's a public statement. It's announcing it, and that destroys any debtor and effect of the law. Because if you know that you're having the status, you can live your life knowing that you won't be removed. Now, from a humanitarian perspective, that's beautiful. But that's not what our law says. Our law says the threat of removal uh, 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 modifies action. People act in accordance with deterrence. That's how laws often work, right? I won't be arrested for jaywalking, but perhaps if I know I may be ticketed, I may not do it. Ha, right? But, you know, people under 21 drink, even though they're not supposed to. The second factor is the way DAPA is structured in that once you're given this deferred status, you now get work authorization, you get the earned income tax credit, you're eligible for Social Security, eligible for Medicaid, 
even though you're not given a formal legal adjustment of status, for all intents and purposes, there is a significant change in who you are as a person in relation to the rest of the country. And in terms of Chevron, if you want to talk about Chevron, this is contrary to the scheme, right? The scheme that Congress designed was saying that if you're in this not lawful status presence, I'm sorry, if you're not here lawfully, you are effectively a pariah. And we may not like that. But this law circumvents virtually every aspect and tries to make them in almost all respects like someone who's here is lawfully present. It does not give them a green card. It does not give them citizenship. It is not executive amnesty. By all accounts, it makes them here uh, uh, you know, feel welcome at home. And that's a, that's a good thing. It makes your heart feel good. But that is not the scheme that Congress designed. And until Congress changes it, the president lacks the authority to do it by himself. Thank you. And uh, we have we have time for questions. I can talk about anything else or whatever whatever you have in mind. Questions? Yes, man, in the front. So, so actually, and I don't have the numbers handy, but a lot of people do self-deport. Um, a lot of people actually do go back to their home countries for fear of removal. They'd rather go back on their own terms. And I don't have the number, but there, there, is, a, there is a sizable number of people who do this. Um, even if the number is small, and let's just say for argument's sake it is small, it's still the scheme Congress designed, right? Even if the number of people that New York City tickets for jaywalking is actually quite small, I'm guessing this number is nearly insignificant, thanks to Blasio, right? Even if this number is very small, it still serves as a deterrent for human behavior. Because if I see a cop and I'm thinking about jaywalking, maybe I won't do it, right? So the debtor in effect of the law is something that DAPA seeks openly to, to vitiate, to weaken. Um, and uh, I think this is a, a core element of why, again, the idea of a pretext. Now, one point let me make this clear. Neither Texas nor, nor I are challenging the president's priorities, right? If the president has simply released a memo saying that I'm going to prioritize deporting felons over families, right? I will use my resources to deport felons. There'd be no objection for me at all. The objection only arises because of the decision to use this deferred action as a way of granting this quasi status to those here, right? And indeed, as the injunction stands now, the president can still prioritize felons over families, nothing stopping him. That is, if a person comes with the immigration system, they're found to be a family member, you know, people with children, put them in the back of the line, that's fine. If someone comes to the system and they're, they're, they're a felon, they're a bad person, put the front of the line. There, there's no objection whatsoever to that. It's this means of using deferred action as a way to grant this quasi-status, what could be a legal presence, if you will, to those here. Other questions? Yes, sir. This is kind of a twofold question. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court will be more here? And uh, what do you, do you have thoughts on what they'll probably Right, so, so um, the first question is when will the Supreme Court hear it? And um, so again, the Fifth Circuit ruled yesterday, if this, I would not want to be in the SG's, the Solicitor General's office right now, because they're, 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 they're scrambling, right? Because the quicker they file it. So if the SG files the next week or so, which is my guess, and Texas does not get an extension, this case we heard in May of 2016, with a decision by end of June 2016. If Texas gets an extension, which is conceivable, it's just a 30-day extension, these are granted automatically for the most part. Um, the SG may oppose it, but if they get an extension, it's kicked to a cert petition filed, uh, a reply filed in basically in, in January. It may be too late here this year unless the government requests expedited arguments. Now, we know cases like Bush v. Gore and other cases, the Supreme Court can move fast when they want to. James and Morby Regan was decided like in two weeks. Youngstown was decided in a couple of weeks. When the court wants to move fast, they can. But I think the equities cut against that very strongly. Let me explain why. Earlier I mentioned that the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, the Fifth, Cir the, um, the Fifth Circuit denied a stay of the district court injunction. 
At that point, the government could have gone to the Supreme Court and sought a stay back in February, no, back in May, May of 2015. This case could have already been at the Supreme Court on the stay. The government did not seek a stay. They went ahead and they appealed normally to the Fifth Circuit. This was a very controversial decision. People didn't like this. So I think the government would have some chutzpah, if I may use a New York term, to say, well, it wasn't so urgent in May, but now this election up, it's really urgent, right? Man, we got an election up. We got to get this stuff settled. Barack Obama's in the White House, right? Now, even if the Supreme Court reverses the Fifth Circuit and they rule that this policy is valid, President Obama can't implement this in his last three months in office. This takes a lot of time to ramp up and build. Indeed, the injunction is preventing from even hiring people to staff this action. So if this, say we had a decision in July of 2015, right? He's got three months until the election. So effectively, this falls to the next president. And I think President Obama is happy with that because President Clinton has said she would expand DAPA beyond what the president did. Now, mind you, the OLC memo said, this is as far as you can go. You can't go any further. And HRC has said, I can go further. Well, we'll see what her lawyers say about that. But President Rubio or President Cruz will say, no, we're not going to do it. So in any respect, regardless of what the Supreme Court decides, the next presidential election will really determine the fate of, perhaps as it should, immigration. And say what you will about Texas' lawsuit, but they basically put this issue uh, uh, on hold and said that let the next election decide this. And again, President Obama announces two weeks after the election, at which point there was really <laughs> no accountability. At uh, the timing of that, I, I, it drives me crazy. Uh, but, but, but again, this is, this is politics. Other questions? No one else. Uh, one thing that I'm wondering about is the whole, because this was a big issue in the district court opinion, is the whole standing of the states to be able to, to, to bring these actions. And it seems like that, that the advocation rationale is kind of novel when it's a status. Mm. Right. So, so the discussion about abdication actually comes from a case called Heckler v. Cheney. Um, and this, this case, is, it's a, Professor Tebby, I'm sure has taught it before. It's, it's, a very, it's a very funny case. So uh, today we think of various lethal injections in terms of whether they violate the Eighth Amendment, right? But back in the 1980s, this wasn't really an idea. And I'll make this the last question before zippering, okay? So some group said, wait a minute, the lethal injection cocktail used to kill people was not FDA approved. Right? It was not approved for safety. Well, duh, right? It's meant to kill you. The, the, the explicit purpose of this cocktail is to take a person's life. And they said that the FDA failed to enforce drug laws against this lethal injection cocktail. And the Supreme Court basically said, first of all, okay, this is ridiculous, but you know, the decision of the executive to enforce her aspects of the law is subject to discretion. And there is discretion, but there was a footnote, maybe even footnote four. Not, not that footnote four, a different footnote four, where they said, but if there's a case where there's some sort of abdication of the law, where an entire category of laws is not being enforced, that may be subject to judicial review. And the court has never really had the occasion to see where this line is. And what the o OLC memo does is try and sketch where that line is. I think if this went to the Supreme Court, I mean, I, I don't make predictions, but they very well may find that this is perhaps a bridge too far, right? that if this works, then there's really no, no threshold. And what makes the valence, or perhaps the optics of this case easier, is there's an injunction, right? This isn't like Obamacare, God love us, right? Where if the court rules against Obamacare, people lose their health insurance, right? No one has gotten DAPA yet, right? The status quo has been maintained. So to tug on Justice Kennedy's heartstrings, which I'm sure they'll try, no one loses anything. So I think this may actually be a good opportunity for the court to say, no more, go pass a bill. Any other questions? Thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. Have a great day.